Uh, we started uh, a couple weeks ago uh, covering uh, the difference in uh, personal righteousness and God's righteousness. Uh, this is uh, continuing our series on rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, for those who may uh, just pick, you know, one of these uh, lessons off of YouTube or whatever, and they don't know what we're covering. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 gives us on instruction on how to study God's Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And when a man fails to divide the Word of Truth, he's not approved unto God. That's what that scripture tells me, simply. That if he don't rightly divide, he's not approved. Uh, you can't be approved unto God uh, in the study of His Word unless you first rightly divide it. It's like uh, Paul was talking about yesterday to some people at our uh, reunion that when you know God's uh, strange that way that when He wants to unite something or bring it in harmony, He cuts it up in pieces and divides it first. One of His first acts in the act of creation in Genesis was He divided the light from the darkness. God's a divider. Uh, even when he created everything, he said, let everything bring forth after its own kind. I mean, they don't mix. That's right. He divides. And the only way you can make sense out of his word is to rightly divide it first. And that's what this uh, series of lessons is focused on, is uh, the right division of God's word. And I've told people when I started this series, both times I've taught it, uh, and in another place I taught it before, that... Uh, uh, this isn't designed to teach you the whole Bible. That's a lifelong endeavor to understand the mind of God. Right. Uh, but this is some uh, puzzle pieces that God has given me that's given me a bigger piece, uh, pick, uh, idea of what the whole picture is. Uh, I, I explained it like this one time when you're putting a puzzle together. You usually get the outside edges first. Then once you have those outside edges, you can start fitting the pieces in there. And that's what this is designed to do, is to give you some outside edges to work with so that you can understand the big picture a little better. Uh, the first uh, uh, part that we studied on this was the difference in the body, soul, and spirit in a lost man and a saved man. And then last uh, time we uh, covered this series, we got into the difference in God's righteousness and personal righteousness. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything we covered on this the last time. I'm going to give you some scripture references. And if you're a preacher or whoever you are, if you uh, can look at these scripture references and not acknowledge that there's a difference in personal righteousness, which came by the law of God, and the imputed righteousness of God, which comes by the faith of Jesus Christ, then you're just refusing to acknowledge what God says. Amen. But here's your scripture references real fast, and then we'll go on to this week's lessons. Romans 10, 1 to 4. In Romans 10, 1 to 4, you're told that the Jew, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they had not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And then he says that Christ is the end. of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe. Christ is the end of it. So somewhere back here there was a beginning and there was a time when the law was for righteousness. Plain and simple. It's not hard. If God tells you that Christ is the end of something, then before he showed up, it was for something. Right. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Personal righteousness ended at Jesus Christ. You go to the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, you're told that John the Baptist's parents who lived back here were blameless before God. Walking in all commandments and ordinances of God. 
They were righteous, that verse tells you. They were righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of God, blameless. They were righteous. They had their own righteousness. Their own righteousness was according to the law. According to the standard of righteousness God gave them in the Old Testament, God couldn't hold anything against them. Why? They were blameless. They did what he said. Then in Philippians chapter 3, Verses 3 to 11, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. And then Paul goes on down to tell you and the uh, uh, boast about the own righteousness, his righteousness that he had in the law. And it's the same exact word that the Jews describe John the Baptist, mother and father, Paul says, uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul had the same righteousness, but then he goes on to say that he wanted to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. It's the righteousness of God. It's God's righteousness now that Paul said he wants to have. Right. Not his own righteousness, which was in the law, but God's righteousness. And God's righteousness, according to that scripture, is by faith. Okay? That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 to 11. And then Philippians 3, 9, by the law, his righteousness. Uh, under the law, men had their own personal righteousness. Ezekiel 3.20 tells you that if a man turns from his righteousness, his righteousness, and the, in that verse it's a right, his righteousness is something that he did. That if he turns from that, he dies in his sin. Ezekiel 3.20. And the righteousness that he hath done shall not be remembered, is what God said. What was it? It was his righteousness. It was something that he did and that if he turned from it, God, he would die in his righteousness and God would not remember anything that he had done to gain that righteousness. <coughs> Isaiah 64, 6, where we're going to start this week, tells us that by the works of the law, or that's Galatians. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that these, this righteousness, which was back here, was as filthy rags. So then you go over to Galatians 3, 11 on this side of the cross, and Paul says, No flesh by the works of the law. No flesh justified. Notice this. In his sight. So what happened? When men died down here, there was this big place they went called Abraham's bosom. Why? They couldn't appear before God and be justified right. in his sight. That's why when Christ died, he went down here and he preached, and these souls were led captive. He took them captive, took them to heaven. Many of the Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament saints were seen walking around Jerusalem after the resurrection, the Bible tells you. So that's what we're getting on. That's where we're starting this week. A man could have righteousness under the law. This righteousness was his own. It was by works, but in God's sight, he was filthy, could not be justified. So turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We got here last week, but I want to drive this home a little bit this morning.
Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 18, the writer of Hebrews here, which is a point of contention, kind of needlessly most of the time. Uh, it's God's word. Uh, let's just say God wrote it. How's that sound? Uh, verse 18, the writer here is talking about the time when they come out of uh, Egypt and they were brought to the mountain. And Moses went up to mediate between God and the children of Israel. And they but set up a meeting time for God to come down and talk to them. And when he come down and talked to them, they said, Moses, you talk to him for us from now on. We can't, we can't bear hearing that voice. Scared him to death. And he's bringing you in remembrance of when this happened in the book of Hebrews, I'll point out. He's writing two Hebrews about a bunch of Hebrews and something that happened in their history. And he says in verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount, the ones he's talking to now, the ones this letter is, uh, uh, applies to. He says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And he says, For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mount, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. That's the first impression of any man in the Bible that got a good sight of God came to. They feared and trembled. Okay, that's the first thing you got to uh, realize when you approach God is you have need to fear. God is to be feared. Work out your own salvation in fear and much trembling. Okay? But then he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's a Jerusalem up there. There's a heavenly Jerusalem. Right. Okay? And that's what he's talking about. The heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. Now I want you to see the different groups of people mentioned here. Okay, and he's telling somebody that's reading this about these this different group of people and that who he's writing to is come to a place where these different groups of people are. So you can't make the reader and the people he's telling them they're coming to the same group of people. Right. They're different. We're the readers and he's telling us and whoever's going to be reading this in the future is when I believe it will doctrinally apply. He's telling them they've come to this group of people. And that, that group of people is an innumerable company of angels. Give me the rest of them. General Assembly. Look, general. What can that include? Everything. It's not the angels. It's not the church of the firstborn. My goodness. We're talking about an eternal God and he decides to tell us about a general assembly up there. The things that are revealed to us is given to us and our children, the Bible says, but the secret things belong to God. What else does he have? Other than the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, man, beast. What's up there? What else? Church? Of what? First born. What's Jesus Christ referred to? First born. First born among many brethren. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Man. Who else? God, the judge of all. <coughs> God, <coughs> judge of what? All of these. Judge of all. I wonder what that means. All. <laughs> <laughs> the spirits of just men made perfect. Spirits. 
just men. This includes men and that includes men. And guess what? They're not the same. These are spirits of just men made perfect. That's church of the firstborn among many brethren. The church of the firstborn. What else is there? And to Jesus. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So, it's all the same, right? And the people reading this in Hebrews is the same as those people. No. You got men up there that are in the church, and then you got men up there that are the spirits, they're just men. And at some point in time, they were made perfect. The spirits of just men made perfect. Now, the word just means morally right. That's what it means. To be justified, you're declared morally right or innocent. Now, let's turn to the book of Revelation and we'll see if we can't see some other different groups of people. That's what happens to preachers, man. They take the Bible and they want to just make everything a big old pub. This is what rightly dividing is. You don't read about the church of the firstborn and the spirits of just men made perfect in the general assembly and just think that everybody in heaven is a bunch of people that for the last 6,000 years God decided to make a member of the body of his son. That's a one-time offer All right. that's going on right now. That if you will believe that I came in the flesh and died for your sins and was buried and raised again, and that on belief of that, I will through my grace and your faith give you eternal life, and this life is in my Son, you can have it freely. Amen. That's the offer being given right now. Revelation 7. Verses 11 to 14. John sees a vision here and he says, All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts that fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Now does God cast everybody into the great tribulation? Christ told another group of people early on in the book of Revelation that if they repented of some things, that he would keep them from the hour of temptation which would come upon all the world. So there you got a group of people that's going to be kept from the hour of temptation. And then you got here that's arrayed in white robes that came out of great tribulation. They're not the same. He said, They are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed. Notice this. Whose robes? Their robes. Right. Rick Martin. Jesus gave me his very own robe to wear. Amen. Okay? But they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Okay? So there's a group who washed their robes white. They came out of great tribulation. If, you get, if you're stuck here when the tribulation starts, man, you better wash your robe. Amen. They washed their own robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon, this is a same group. Notice, notice their testimony. The dragon was wroth with the woman. Who's that? Israel. Israel. 
and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep, notice this, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony right. of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like 100% grace? No. Through faith, they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith plus works. And you know, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 24, and people want to explain it away and say that it says what it don't say when James clearly says in James chapter 2, verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Right. That's what it says. Right. Amen. Stop changing it. Here they are, they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation 15. He says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Man, I, you see this stuff happening today, and people, people have this false impression that when they're in the tribulation, it's just going to be so easy to just refuse that mark and be saved. I want you to notice what it said there. They had gotten victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. You don't know how confused and deceitful that time is going to be. Amen. It's a lot more than just simply refusing a mark and dying and being saved. There's four things right there that these people get victory over. Four of them. But they stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. They sing, notice, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Right. Two songs. They got the song of Moses, the servant, 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 and the song of the Lamb. Two songs. Amen. Saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, mighty, just, and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Two songs. Who are these people? Jesus. People that have personal righteousness. If you think Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, is coming to this earth one day, to just let things continue as they are right now and not hold people accountable and get rid of this sex-crazed, sin-depraved world that we live in, you're mistaken. When he shows up, man, he comes to put down all things that offend God. Amen. And get rid of them. That's why those of us that are saved now can, like Chuck does, every time somebody says you got a, purpose, a, a word of praise or testimony, he can send up and tears run down his face <laughs> and say, I want to thank God that he died for my sins and saved me. Amen. That's why we stand and sing this song, man. We know how good God is. Paul said in Ephesians, but by his mercy, for his late, great love wherewith he loved us, he quickened us together with Christ and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're already seated there right now, presently. And he done it, Paul said, that in the ages to come, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen. See that group of people over there on that side? And all in this group of people and these different groups of people we see and whatever groups of people are going to be in God's creation all through eternity, God's going to say, this is how good I am. We're going to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, God. You are good. There's a uh, revelation they're called servants over and over and over. And that's important too because yeah. Paul said in Galatians that God hath given us a spirit of adoption wherefore we are no more servants but sons. <laughs> And in Hebrews, Paul, the writer makes a difference between Moses and Christ by saying Moses was faithful as a servant, but Christ as a son. Well, there's a difference. And we, through Christ, are made the sons of God. But people during tribulation, Old Testament, millennial kingdom, will never be more than servants. That's a big difference. Yeah, it is a big difference. He lays it out for you in the verses you just talked about there. The difference in a servant and a son. But they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of Lamb. That's not the church. Revelation 5 9. How do I know that's not the church? What does the church include? When we say the word church, what are we talking about? The Apostle Paul gives you a very definitive definition. That's the double word, what a definitive definition. But he gives you a very clear definition on what the church is. The church is the body of Christ, and it's made up of Jew and Gentile. It's made up of all nations. Whether you're Greek, Ethiopian, Asian, European, whatever you are. Revelation 5 9 says, And they sung a new song. Is the song of Moses new? No. <laughs> no. Man, that's God's been dealing through he's been he was dealing with Israel through all the Old Testament. Twelve chapters and it's Israel. Up until the book of Matthew. Twelve chapters in the Bible, Israel, until Matthew. Most of that book is Israel. Most of it. But this is a new song. They sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and the open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, notice, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Who's that? There's no other organism in the Word of God that includes every kindred and tongue and nation and people. If you can find it for me, by all means, show it to me. Show me one other organism or body in the whole Bible that includes every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Right. That's the body of Christ. The church sings a new song. Moses, the servant of God, like Paul's talking about in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Let's read it. <clears throat> anybody, anybody goes and reads the Song of Moses, there's no doubt what it's about. The whole, the whole wilderness experience and everything for that Jew is going to be replayed during the tribulation. That's why it's called a parable in the book of Psalms. And when they sing that song over there, it talks about the Lord of triumph, the glory of sea. The Lord is a man of war. These are all second coming references. They have nothing to do with the church. It's about the salvation of Israel from a great persecutor. It's it's clear as it's clear as anything. But people would rather just look at it and stare at a verse for a very long time and hope they can figure it out. Rather than actually go research what the song of Moses is. The only people that be able to sing that song is people that's going to be saved during the tribulation period. <clears throat> Galatians 4, 1 to 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. 
but as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. How do you receive the Spirit that he's talking about? Ephesians 1.13, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise upon believing the gospel of your salvation and the gospel of your salvation in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, I declare unto you how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel of salvation. So here he says that they received this spirit. He has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I guess here we can take a break and talk about an inheritance. We're not going to do that. But if you study that out, you go find scripture that says that if you're the son of God, you are an heir, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Right. But after being a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and as being a joint heir with Jesus Christ, there's things God has promised you as a joint heir that you can't lose. Amen. You're a joint heir with Him. But there's also things that He's going to receive that if you don't suffer with Him in this life, you won't receive that inheritance. Can I, can I correct that just a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. What it actually says is if if a son, then an heir yeah. of God and yeah. joint heirs yeah. with Christ, if so be that we suffer. The heirship that we have of God is in his house. We have that inheritance up there. It's incorrupt, one to file, fate if not away. The joint heir with Christ is if we suffer in this world. Yeah. Uh, just uh, you gotta you gotta suffer to be exalted. And the heirship of Christ is found in Psalm 2. Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the world for thy possession. Christ has been made heir of a kingdom. And if we want to reign with him in the world to come, Paul said if we suffer, we shall reign. But if we deny him, he will deny us. We can be denied that inheritance. So you just had a little backwards there. He's, no, on, the, he's, on, the, he's on the right path. I should know he was better than I am. You just, you just don't know as much as me. It's okay. You can tell we love each other, can't you? I should have talked this morning. This is awful. <laughs> so that's personal righteousness. I don't think we're going to get into this one a whole lot. What we talk about this morning is the difference in a man's personal righteousness by the works of the law and the righteousness of God. I've done showed you a clear difference in the book of Romans and uh, where was the other one? Philippians. Yeah. The difference in Zechariah and, and or Zacharias and Elizabeth, John the Baptist, two parents. The, the righteousness that Paul had uh, under the law and the fact that he lays out in Romans the difference in the Jews seeking their own righteousness and not being submitted to the righteousness of God. Man, they're not the same. Deuteronomy 6.25. Two different righteousnesses. Now God's righteousness is imputed. It's imputed. Romans 4. Romans 4, he says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. Now don't make righteousness and justification the same word. They're two different words. So people will go here and say, Well, the Bible says Abraham wasn't justified by works. We're talking about righteousness. 
I can go back there in the Old Testament and show you where the Bible does clearly say that Abraham was justified by faith and believing something. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with a book like that that keeps tripping you up? Take it the wise and their own craftiness. They <laughs> take it the wise and their own craftiness, the Bible says, and then their own conceits. God, man, you're dealing with a dangerous being that he tells you. You can't come to me unless you're humble. And if you come to me with pride, I'm going to resist you, resist you, resist you. And then he can also get in there and discern the intense thoughts of the heart. Then you can come there thinking, man, I sure am glad I'm humble. That book's booby trapped from cover to cover. It's booby trapped. <laughs> it's got something in there to trip up every wise and proud man that's ever lived. Only the humble, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, can make it through that book safely. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath word of glory, but not before God. Well, what do you do with that? Two different Abrahams. One before he was circumcised, and Paul tells you the difference here in this chapter. The one he's talking about is the Abraham that God gave righteousness before he received circumcision, which is a sign of the righteousness he had being uncircumcised. And then later on, God said, offer your son on an altar. After he was circumcised, and Abraham went up there, got ready to kill him. God said, now I know that thou fearest God. Two different Abrahams. One of these Abrahams is the father of all of us. Faithful Abraham, the Bible refers to him as. You got Abraham in here that's the father of the nation of Israel. When they come out of Egypt, God said, do this. And they said, all the Lord has said we will do. And God's going to hold that nation to that standard. Now Romans 4, 1 to 7 here. For if Abraham were justified by words, he hath word of glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that, notice this, justifieth the ungodly. That's the God I believe in. Amen. The one that justifies the ungodly. Not the one that if you come to him promising that you're sorry for everything you've done, he'll justify you. I believe in the God that justifies the ungodly man. And in here, we're going to finish up here real fast. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How has it been reckoned? It was when he was uncircumcised. Now Romans 4, right here, he says, Being not weak in faith, verse 19, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving God glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Amen. Death, burial, resurrection in those two verses. That's who it's imputed to. God's righteousness. I'm going to close right there. i got maybe one more lesson. I don't know, maybe two more. On the difference in God's righteousness, which is imputed by grace through faith, and man's personal righteousness, which was by the works of the law. 
And then what you're going to come to next week, we're going to get over to Romans chapter 3, where after Paul lays his stuff out in the book of Romans, he asks this question, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. There's a lot of stuff left on the difference in these two righteousnesses. In Hebrews chapter 11, let me say this real quick, there's, there's three men mentioned there in that chapter that were prior to the flood, and all three of them are, are types of these dispensations. Abel the, is a type of the Old Testament Jew who by faith offered a more excellent sacrifice. It was, it was somebody living by sacrifices like the Old Testament. Enoch just said, by faith walk with God. He didn't, he didn't have any works and he was raptured prior to the flood. Noah becomes a type of the tribulation Jew who's left here and by, by faith and works builds an ark for the saving of his house and comes out of the other side of judgment to inherit the, the earth. All three of those men show these different these different dispensations and salvation. But God they dealt with them all the same, didn't he? Hmm? God dealt with them all the same, though, didn't he? Of course he did. <laughs> These guys couldn't find it with a magnifying glass. <laughs> Even though God said he's magnified his word above all his name, God's, put it, God's magnified it.